that men have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Looking here at our lesson this morning, the questions often asked. I'm going to go ahead and read through the introduction here. It says, this ABCs of Critical Program is specifically designed to teach you the basics of the Christian life. Let me stop there for a moment. Because as we've been going through the ABCs of Christian uh, growth, I hope that everyone has learned something. Has uh, learned something that maybe they didn't know before, or that it's reiterated to you what you believe, and that you now can go ahead and show some scripture. And this is why it's important to keep these lessons and then to look back on them frequently, not just to put them in your Bible one time and then lose them and, and forget all about it. This is so that we can know what the Bible teaches and be able to show people what the Bible teaches. Going on, he says, uh, the author of the curriculum says, but as with most things in life, we never stop learning. And you will most certainly find yourself asking questions such as, what does the Bible say about, or how may I, and then you fill in the blank. Answer to many questions will be found in the studies you've already done or will be doing. I strongly recommend that you review your past work from time to time, especially any time you have a question. In this particular study, you will find Bible answers to a number of commonly asked questions which are not covered in this series. This is one study which will have expanded your question. Don't hesitate to ask your older brother, your older sister, or your pastor about anything you want to know from the Bible. And I would throw that challenge out to the people of our church that if you have a question, a Bible question, uh, find a holy brother and sister in Christ, or brother or sister in Christ, that maybe you can ask. And if they can't show you, or they can't answer for you, then both of you come and ask the pastor. Uh, because it's important that we all know what the Word of God teaches. And so try to, uh, try to do as the Bible says and sharpen one another. Be as uh, iron sharpening iron. And ultimately, if you don't know older brother or sister in Christ, admit that you don't know. Don't feel the pressure of pride and say, man, i got to come up with some answer and just pull something out of the air. That's how you get false doctrine. Amen? Sometimes it's, it's better just to say, you know what, that's a good question. I really don't know. Uh, but let me study it and see, let me study my Bible and see what I can come up with for you. And if you study it and you can't come up with an answer, then say, you know what, I've studied it, I can't figure it out, let's go talk to preacher. You know what, there's a lot of things that people come and talk to me about that I have to tell them, you know what, can I get back to you on that? I don't always have an answer right away for everybody. Because we've got to make sure, once again, we let the Word of God speak. And that we don't speak on behalf of the Word of God. We let the Word of God speak. So, be, be ready, because questions are going to be asked. You're going to ask questions as you grow in Christianity. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to ask questions. All of us are going to. Remember that old saying when we were in school, there is no dumb question? Uh, the only dumb question is a question that's not asked. That's right. Uh, if you don't ask, how are you going to learn? And so let me challenge you, even if you're an older Christian, once again, don't be intimidated by pride. And let the pressure of pride keep you from asking a question. Well, I would ask this question, but then people might think that I'm not a, a very mature Christian. I'd rather have people think I'm a young or immature Christian and get the answer than going on putting on this masquerade or this facade that I'm a very mature Christian and be wrong the whole time. So make sure that you ask questions. Let's look at real quickly something he challenges us to keep in mind when asking questions about the Bible. Number one, he says the Bible is God's complete revelation of himself to man. Now remember that word revelation, ultimately we can define it as revealing. So it's God revealing himself to man. It does not tell us everything there is to know. John 21, 25 tells us, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. So you might want to underline this because this is a good, a good saying he has here. It does not tell us everything there is to know, but everything God wants us to know. Yeah. Big difference. We can't understand everything God knows. We're finite. He's infinite. But one day in heaven we'll understand it all. Because God goes completely. Right now He reveals to us what we can comprehend, what we can understand, what He wants us to know, or what is important for us to know. Second thing the author says, the Bible has 
The answer, you've heard me say many times before, or give the illustration many times before, of the, the preacher boy from Bible College would be out street preaching, and he'd go up to a car and start off and say, Hey, Jesus is the answer. Now, what's your question? And ultimately, this book has every answer to every question. Yep. Someone says, Well, preacher, there's some very difficult questions out there. Guess what? It requires study. Uh, everything's not shallow in the Bible. There are some very deep things in the Bible. And remember what uh, Paul wrote, how that God uses uh, the, the simple things of this world to confuse those that are wise. And so the Bible has the answer. Sometimes it requires diligent and searching study to find it. Not because God wants to make things difficult, but because we are sinful, weak, finite, or perhaps just spiritually immature over in the book of Hebrews. Chapter number 5, if you have your Bibles, you can turn over there real quickly. Hebrews chapter number 5, verses 11 through 14. The author of the book of Hebrews, who many believe to be Paul, writes here, Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered. Seeing ye are galled hearing, for when, for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have me that one teach you again. Which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Once again, you have to acknowledge where you are as a Christian. And when you acknowledge where you are, whether you're in the infant stage, or you're a toddler, you're a child, or you're... You're a, a, an adolescent, or maybe you're an adult. You have to acknowledge where you are and realize that you have not arrived. That you're supposed to continue to grow. Which means that you're going to have questions, and when others come to you, you're going to be limited on some of the answers you're going to be able to give because you're limited based on your knowledge of the Bible. So there are going to be times when someone comes to you and you are going to need to study it out for yourself. By the way, I would once again challenge you, if someone comes to you, a family member, another a member of our church, and asks you a Bible question, don't just automatically say, let's go ask the preacher. Go ahead and look at it for yourself. Try to study it out. I don't mind answering questions, but when you search it out yourself, a lot of times it will help you to remember the answer. If you're just given the answer, then it'll, it'll, next time you may not remember where you found that verse or what the verse was or really what the correct answer was, the, the scriptural answer was. Once again, it's much like in school. If your teacher just gives you the answers to the history test and doesn't make you look for the answers, then later on in the year when they do a review, you're going to have a hard time remembering it because you're going to have to study it yourself. Moving on, let us see there are some things we may never really understand, especially when it comes to the Lord's workings in our life and those around us. Most believers develop a list of things they want to ask when they get to heaven, yet they know God already has the answer and it's the right one. This is so true that we have to come to this conclusion that we're not going to understand everything here. God isn't going to tell us or give us an answer for every possible thing. But, nonetheless, the answer is still in God's Word. It may not be the specific answer such as, we've all heard this one before, where did Adam's sons get their wives from? Okay, well, that's not going to keep anyone from going to heaven, or I mean, keep anyone out of hell and, and, and help them get to heaven. So uh, that's one of those ones that, there's an answer, but God just doesn't give it to us right now. Because you know what? It's not important. Once again, we can get caught up in so many small, more minute things, and that's what the devil wants us to do, is he wants us to trip over silly little things that we miss the main message. And so we have to understand that there are some things that we're just not going to be able to explain. Uh, God gives us answers in the form of principles, but we may not be able to give an answer for every little minute uh, question that's asked. And by the way, the critics out there of God, the critics of His Word, they like to ask those silly little questions. They like to ask those things because they're trying to put doubt in people's minds. In Genesis chapter number 8, verse number 20, it says here, that he far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that he far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? 
uh, it's a question that's being asked here. We know that God has an answer to our questions. And all of His answers are right. But sometimes He's not going to answer our question in this life. Once again, we have to come to a point where if it's a, if it's a, a question like the example I just gave you, that we get rid of our pride and say, you know what? I don't know. I guess we'll find that out in heaven. What's that? That's a pastor question. That's a pastor question. There you go. And then the pastor says, I don't know. Amen. We have to give over our pride. Once again, sometimes people want, want to be able to answer every single question. And really, the answers are the principles. And we need to point people back to the principles in the Word of God. And sometimes we need to say, you know what, I don't have a specific answer for this, but I know the principles of God's Word. And here are what the principles are. And don't get caught up in your pride to where you come up with something that is ridiculous and, and is heresy. I, there was a guy that was attending our church at one time. He, he wasn't a member or anything, but he attended our church at one time. And I remember later on as I saw him out, uh, he had stopped coming to church. I, I went to visit him, and he was talking to me, and he said, I know the truth about Adam and Eve. Hmm. I said, really? What's that? And he goes, I know there was a, another woman in the Garden of Eden. And I, he told me the name, name of the woman, I think it was Gwen or something like that. I said, where in the world did you get that? He said, that's not anywhere in the Bible. He goes, no, but someone wrote a book about this. And I thought, well, see, that's the problem. You know, People trying to explain nonsense away because they're trying to answer a question that really doesn't mean a hell of beans. That's right. And so we have to be careful about these things as Christians that we ultimately remember that God has revealed to us what He wants us to know. And what He wants us to know is principles. And these principles answer our questions Although there may be some minute things that will never be answered until we get to glory. And when we get to glory, we get those answers. I guarantee you we're not going to be sitting there saying, well, I wonder. We're going to understand it all. We're going to say, oh, that makes sense. Now moving on to 2 Timothy chapter number 2. We are instructed, uh, as Paul instructed Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter number 2, and verse number 23, we're instructed to avoid foolish and unlearned Questions. Yep. Foolish and unlearned questions. Know what a fool is and what a wise man is. A wise man knows what's right and he does it. A foolish man knows what's right and doesn't do it. So there are a lot of foolish questions out there. There are a lot of people who know what's right, but for some reason, because they want to play the part of a fool, they're going to ask a question that is nonsense. Yep. To try to disprove the Word of God, to try to disprove uh, sanctification and separation and living holy. People are, you know who actually are probably more guilty of asking foolish questions? People who say they're Christians. <laughs> they're probably more guilty of asking foolish questions, questions that don't really affect anything, than lost people. So it says, Avoid foolish and unlearned questions. And that's in 2 Timothy 2.23, where he says to Timothy, But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strifes. And then he also challenges Timothy in his first letter, 1 Timothy 4.7. He challenges him to avoid, uh, along with that, profane and old wives' fables. In 1 Timothy 4.7, he writes, but refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Now that word profane, we, we know the word profanity. The word profane means irreverent to anything. Not sacred, secular, or relating to secular things. So we have to be careful that we do not get involved in answering irreverent, secular questions that don't help but rather, gender strife, as he said in his second letter to Timothy. And then in his first Timothy, he said, uh, he challenged him to instead exercise himself unto godliness. Uh, in other words, the questions that you uh, answer and the questions that you ask as a Christian ought to help you to grow Amen. as a Christian. Or help someone else grow. Uh, the author goes on to say, this really means our questions should pertain to faith, personal growth, godliness, and helpful Bible study. If all you want to do is nail the preacher, or stump your older brother or older sister, you will more than likely succeed, but will not be profited nor benefit anyone. 
I've met people like that. You may have met people like that. The question is just to do one of these. Aha! Did it profit anybody? What is the point of asking the question? Did it make you stronger? Did it make the person you asked stronger? Did it strengthen anyone? It was just a ah! I came up with a question someone could answer. Guess what? There are a lot of those out there. So he says, be careful. Make sure that your questions help strengthen you and the questions you answer help strengthen others. Next, he says, be very careful. You do not major on the minors and minor on the majors. One of Satan's traps is to get a believer to run off on some incidental hobby horse to the neglect of soul winning, real Bible study, sweet fellowship, faithful Christian living. In 1 Timothy chapter number 6, verse number 3, Paul writes here, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doing about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth. Supposing that, is, that gain is godliness from such withdrawal thyself, but godliness with contentment is great gain. I've given you the illustration time and time again of a young man I grew up with who was a neighbor of mine. He was one of my best friends when I actually got saved and, and got into the Christian school there where I grew up. And how that he went, graduated from Bible college, started working as an assistant pastor. But he started doing this very same thing. He started reading things of the world and then questioning Christianity with foolish questions. And as a result, he left the ministry, he lost his wife, and he only gets his kids every other week or weekend. His marriage is destroyed. His life is totally changed and is upside down. I saw him when we were back in Iowa in July, and he was just a shell of the person that I knew, all because of this. He started major on the minors. He started yeah. to ask questions that had nothing to do with anything, that didn't help him or anyone else grow. So we have to be careful on all these things. When you discover a Bible answer, put it into practice. Some answers you or your old nature will not like. Did you ever find that when you were growing up, your parents would give you answers to questions you had that you didn't like? Can we go to the store? No. Ah! Can we get a hamburger today? Go get an ice cream? No. Ah! Did that mean that you just threw in the towel and gave up? No. You have to you live on. You know, you have to deal with it. Just the other day, uh, one of the phrases that goes around our house and I think around our families uh, may not be the best phrase, but it's when you fall down, suck it up. So I heard Timothy the other morning, suck it up. S U C. I'm trying to spell it out. And I said, Tim, it's actually S-U-C-K. But the point is, is you can't deal with it. Hey, your nature may not like it. God didn't say your old nature had to like it. He just said, you have a question, here's the answer, here's the principle, and we'll live accordingly. James chapter number 1, in verse number 22. James 1, 22, the Bible says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. When you get an answer to a question, put it into practice. Now, let's go ahead and look at some of these questions that he addresses. There's just a few that we're going to be looking at. There's so many more questions that you're going to have, that others around you are going to have. And once again, go back to the Word of God. Go back to the Bible. All right? Because the answers are here. What happens to infants and little children if they die? Now, the first three questions are actually all related or intermingled. What happens to infants and little children if they die? Over to Acts chapter number 13 and verse number 22. Yeah, your Bible, let's look over there real quickly. Acts chapter number 13 and verse number 22. The Bible says, And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king. Referring to the transition from Saul to David as king of Israel. To whom also he gave testimony, and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, Phil. So, we're reading about David. Now, we're going to 2 Samuel, chapter number 23, verses 1 and 2. We have 
the testimony recorded here of Daniel, 2 Samuel chapter number 23, verses 1 and 2. According to the New Testament, there in the book of Acts, David had a testimony that he was a man after God. Here in 2 Samuel 23, verse 1, be the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, said, A man who was raised up on high, the above the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel said, of the Lord spake by me, and his word was in my tongue. Now, here in 2 Samuel chapter number 23, verses 1 through 2, we read about his last words. We read ultimately about his death. Now, the question is asked here in our curriculum, was King David saved? Yeah. Well, of course, uh, only God and an individual know that individual's heart and know whether or not they were saved. But God in His Word reveals to us whether certain people were saved or not. And the correct answer is, yes, He was saved. He uh, was given, we are told that He had this testimony that He was a man after God's own heart. He knew the Lord. He had put His faith in the Lord. Saul, who became Paul, is another one that we know his conversion experience. And so we know that he was saved. Now, once again, uh, when we look around the room, I believe that everybody in this room is saved, but only God and you know whether or not you're saved, and only God and I know whether I'm saved. But ultimately, here we are told that there were some uh, in the Old Testament, some in the New Testament, who had a testimony that they put their faith and trust in God, therefore they were saved. So, uh, first Kings chapter number 2, moving on real quickly. First Kings chapter number 2, verse number 10. The Bible says, So David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of Jerusalem. So his body was laid there in Jerusalem. But in Psalm 23, and this is probably the most well-known psalm of all time. It's read at many uh, people's uh, funerals or grave sites. Psalm 23, verse number 6. David wrote this psalm. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now his body was laid there in Jerusalem, but his spirit went to be with the Lord. So the question was asked, where did David go when he died? Well, his body went in the ground, but his soul went to be with the Lord. Once again, this is sort of setting up for the answer to this question. Because now if we look to 2 Samuel chapter number 12, 2 Samuel chapter number 12, we're reminded of the story where David had committed sin with Bathsheba, Uriah's wife, and after having Uriah executed, that he took Bathsheba to be his wife. She was with child. They had, uh, had this child, and the Bible says in 2 Samuel 12, 23, that the judgment of the Lord came upon David for this sin. And it says, but now he is 